Good afternoon, everyone, and we're here today for our Planning Skills webinar with uh, Western Berkshire Council and Alexandria Neighbourhood Action uh, on the preparation of their local place plan. Uh, with me today um, is Susan Rintel from the Improvement Service, Anthony McGuinness from Western Berkshire Council, and Kevin Mason from Alexandria Neighbourhood Action. Um, and I'm Trevor Moffat, also from the Improvement Service. Uh, just to go through our format for today, it's going to be about 30 minutes worth of presentation and uh, the, same, the same of a, a Q&A session uh, where you get the chance to ask questions to uh, Kevin and Anthony. Um, thanks to everyone who's sent questions in so far. We will try and address as many of those as possible, but I'm aware uh, many more topics will appear as you're, uh, as you're, as you're listening to their, their presentations, so please just use the questions box on the right hand side of your screen to ask these. These are all anonymized unless you don't want them to be. Um, and if you can also just note if you want either Anthony or Kevin to answer a particular question, just say, just note for, for Anthony, for instance, besides that. If you also have any technical difficulties today, please just put that in the question box as well. I'll be monitoring that throughout. So I, I hopefully be able to uh, fix any, any minor problems that you have. Um, what I'm going to do just now is I'll just minimise our screens. Uh, we've just had some feedback from previous webinars that um, smaller devices like uh, mobile phones won't be able to see the slides unless we minimise our, our own faces. So during the presentation part, uh, uh, we won't be there, but the slides will be, and I'll bring us back in for the Q&A. So I'll just do that just now and then transfer over to Anthony from Western Barbershop. Uh, can you see that, Trevor? Yep, we can see that fine, Anthony. Uh, just go ahead. I'll just mute ourselves. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Anthony McGuinness. I'm the team leader and forward planning in Western Berkshire Council. Um, also, the lead on our approach to integrating community and spatial planning and um, the merger of locality plans and local place plans, which are our approach to empowering and emancipating our communities. Um, basically, I'm going to take you through the first half, because I'm aware there are some non-planners in here, so I'll take you through what the Planning Act and what local place plans are under the Scottish Government's Plan Planning Act 2019. I'll also take you through our approach, um, how we started, where we've got to, and some little um, facts and figures from what we've done in terms of trying to do this from a resource perspective. So, let's go. What did the Planning Act do? Well, it actually made us have a statutory link between community and development planning and actually implemented the a new concept of local place plans, um, which I'll get on to later. But generally, we've already been doing this to an extent. There's always been a statutory link between community and development planning, most of the authorities I've worked for in my life, and also uh, most communities have been doing community-led action plans, neighbourhood action plans, and so forth for our community planning partners for a while. Um, so these terms are not really different, and this approach is not really that much. It's similar, slightly um, the same, but has a bit more reaching implications for communities. So local place plans, what are they? So this is taken from the Scottish Government's website and things that I've collated over a while to try and provide uh, an example of what they're meant to do. But generally what the Scottish Government say, there are a local place plans a proposal as to the development or use of land. It may also identify land and buildings that the community body consider to be of particular significance to their local area. So it's to give them a more place-based approach to how they see their community being developed over a longer term. It's to give them um, a focus for aspirations and their needs, and, and that is useful in a community planning setting, but also a development plan setting um, for most of us that are probably listening to this presentation. So they have implications for most of us in a planning size. What do we need to do? Well, we actually need to formally invite local communities to prepare a local place plan. We have to give them a date and when their local place plan has to be with us. And we also have to make clear what the resources are available to them from a local authority perspective. In the evidence report, we have to actually categorically detail how we have done this and what resources we've made available to communities. And we also, when a local place plan has been forwarded to us, we've got to validate it. 
And if it's invalid, we must give reasons to the community why we're not accepting it. But also, communities now can indicate when a local development plan needs replaced, but they need to give reasons for this within a local place plan. And this is something that's a bit different to what we've been doing beforehand and gives communities a bit more say in how the development plan for the area is developed and taking on board what they want for their communities. But there's a lot of missing parts, and this is from my perspective. This isn't really a council view. What I think needs to be addressed is um, what do we do with them once we get them? What happens if we disagree that the local development plan needs amended? What are their status? That needs to be thought out for a development management point of view and also the resources to do these. There has resource implications for councils, especially small councils like Western Bartonshire, but it also has costs to the communities themselves and how they do this. The financial implications, the um, paperwork that uh, came with the government's planning act estimated that this could be cost between 3.28 and 9.84 million for all 34 planning authorities in Scotland. But that's not just the cost of producing one, it's the training, it's the capacity building, and it's the staff required to do this. So that figure, in my opinion, could be a lot greater than it is on paper. So that's just a little overview of the Planning Act and local place plans and what they're intended to do, and some of the things that still need to be thought out and hopefully will be addressed through secondary legislation and government guidance. But what did we do as a council and a community planning partnership? So I'm just going to start from the beginning. Um, what did we do? Well, we moved to basing everything we do around place and empowering our communities. That was a commitment through the Community Planning Western Bartonshire Board and the Council to approach of it. And it responded in the integration of community and my team, development planning team, working together to deliver this. It was about taking service provision and basing it around what our communities want from their own plans, from their own perspective. But why did we do it? Well, we wanted to have a clear focus on place. I'll come on to talk about our local outcome improvement plan later on, but it is titled the plan for place, which is a clear status and a clear declaration of how we want to address service provision and our communities. It's all for about places for people and what they want. So therefore, we have moved it towards a person and neighborhood centric model of planning focusing resources on outcomes and aligning them, but it also reduces the amount of consultation that we do with our communities. Most of them actually think we only do one plan, and when we come out with a lot of plans and a lot of consultations, as we all know, they get fatigued with it, and they would rather we just go on and do it with them. Some of them actually ask why we're still consulting with them. But what it does do as well, our approach, we wanted to build resilience and capacity in our communities to prepare their own plan to actually help to deliver what they wanted for their area. And why not? We all think in Western Barnsley Council it's a good way of doing things and it's about the embodiment of our community empowerment strategy going forward. So we've been on quite a bit of a journey. We started this approach three years ago and the first thing that we tried to do was the integration of the teams and to train and capacity build those and other services and our community planning partners. So we went through a lot of training on um, training the place standard for trainers, engagement, confrontation training, and that sort of thing. So we could better deal with all aspects of our communities and what they suffer on a day-to-day -day basis. We developed a clear brand, which is called Your Place, Your Plan. And we were invited to be the pathfinder for the Scottish Government on aligning community and spatial planning as part of the development of the Planning Scotland Act 2019. We did do early progress. We moved to a place-based consultation model. And as I said earlier, we had our local outcome improvement plan adopted. The place-based consultation covered both the local outcome improvement plan, the local development plan two main issues report, and our first locality plan. We did it using the place standard, and we did it a couple of different ways to make it easier on our communities to do that. But we also moved on from that information to deliver, start to develop our community empowerment strategy. And one of those aims was merging the locality plans that are under the Community Empowerment Act with the local place plans that are now under the Planning Scotland Act. 
we thought it was a better idea to merge the two of them. Therefore, that service provision for our community planning partners could also be targeted around the needs of what our communities actually want. And we ramped up our digital and social media presence as a result. Where are we now? Well, as I said earlier, we launched our community empowerment strategy in March of this year. However, the COVID virus has meant that we couldn't do as much of our pr promotion and our community engagement as we wanted to do on its launch. But it was pre prepared in partnership with our communities. And it's a strategy based on shaping decision and local plans with trust. It does set out some principles and it's an action plan a link to the, the six themes, which is one of the slides that I've put on the bottom, if you can see that. But we're very focused on delivery. And one of the ways that we really think is the practical delivery of this of community empowerment strategies is our locality place plans, not physically, but also for non-physical needs of our communities. Local development plan two itself is the first plan in Scotland that has taken an approach to trying to embody locality place plans within its um, structure. The plan is due for adoption um, this month by planning committee and probably September by the government and it will become our adopted plan. But it also brings these locality place plans in as supplementary guidance to give them the same status as the development plan. We did this deliberately because we wanted to give our communities a better say in how their place is developed through development, but also through um, grants from what they want. By having a plan that is part of a statutory development plan gives them a greater access to funding as well. But also what we decided to do was put a policy framework in. This was a calculated gamble, well not gamble, calculated approach to how we would incorporate local place plans in the future. And basically this is what would be our validation framework for local place plans going forward. We also decided to put a policy in um, trying to future-proof the plan um, to how local place plans or locality place plans as we are calling them would be considered in, by the development industry and it just gives a clear direction on how we will deal with them for our development management staff going forward and it also gives the communities a lot more power to, do, to actually engage with developers and for developers to engage with them to try and come to a mutually beneficial approach to some things that they must disagree on that's within the community's locality place plan. Locality place plans, well, we're still in pilot testing. This is a new concept for us, and it's a new concept in Scotland, trying to combine the two of them together. So we're taking it slow and steady, but also that marries up with the resources that we have available and the staff that we have within the council to do this, and also not to overburden our communities with a concept that might actually be alien to them. So we had two fully community-led pilots. One is in Alexandria, which Kevin will discuss later on, and the other is in Old Kilpatrick and Bowling. These are supported by the council, but they are clearly the community's plans. And the first step in locality place plans is actually what we are calling neighbourhood action plan. It's a community-led action plan. It's a local place plan. They all mean the same thing. But what that does is let our communities drive forward with their aspirations for their place and how they want to deliver them in the short, medium and long term. Over the longer term, in areas which don't have such a good community spirit as Alexandria and local Patrick, or which don't have enough groups together that could pull one of these um, locality place plans together, we have, as a council, decided to try and do a lot more community capacity building before we launch this approach there. So we're doing um, that approach in an area of Clybank. We've been doing that for over a year and we're doing it in Castle Hill and Dumbarton, which is one of the deprived areas in Dumbarton. Um, and we are having um, difficulties engaging with the community there. So in effect, we have not chosen easy pilots to try this approach on, but communities that would benefit from them and emancipate them under a community empowerment strategy. What we've also done is um, together with East Ayrshire Council was we set up a benchmarking and shared learning network because we both had identified that there was a need for this. East Ayrshire Council, if for many that will know, have been an exemplar in doing community-led actions plans after the, over the last decade and we wanted to learn from them but also they wanted to learn from us and our approach to locality place plans and how we would actually deliver these within that model. So it became it became apparent that 
the aim that we'd set up was becoming more it was becoming more apparent for um, communities and also other councils going forward to have an, an area to share experience and to form contacts. So with East Ayrshire Council, we had a series of meetings and a large event where our community planning colleagues and planners could get together to discuss and learn from each other. However, it became apparent going through all the local place plans and discussion at HOPs and discussion at other webinars and so on that I'd been involved in, there was a need to widen the group out and last in the last two weeks we had a successful microsoft teams meeting with fife and angus council planners and community planners and lock Womond in the national trossic parks authority the benchmarking and shared learning group is also being looked after by the improvement service in trevor and there is a microsoft teams channel for it and i think if anybody else it's in this webinar or other colleagues from that webinar that are community planners or planners wish to join that then please let me know and i can arrange for you to be involved in that but it's a good opportunity to share everything especially when we're coming up with local place plans that um, are bringing difficult challenges for us all so what we learned so far from our process quite a lot it's about language and explanations they need to be clear sometimes as planners or community planners we do have this propensity to talk in technical language communities just don't understand that and the terms that are coming out neighborhood action plans community-led action plans, local place plans, locality place plans, just confuse communities. So we actually need to be clear on what we want to do with our communities in this. But we also have to understand that our communities have passions. They have different cap capacities and abilities within them to deliver these things. We need to tailor our approach, which we have done. Each of our pilots have a different tailored approach to our process. It's basically informed by what they want to do, not by what the council want to do. But it's also about understanding timescales. Some of our groups have other um, other priorities, and for these, that might be you know difficult for them to do local place plans. And Kevin will give you an overview of how Alexandria have found this, but they still need support. They can't do this on their own, and that is an implication for the community planning partnership of all our authorities, but also for the communities within themselves. But the big topic is about resources, as I mentioned earlier. This is a resource intensive. There'll be a lot of us on the calls or a lot of us on the webinar that have been doing this for a while and know how resource intensive this is, but it has implications for small teams such as Western Bartonshire, and it costs. So far from what we've done, we have spent £10,000 on staff time and hiring venues for our communities. That doesn't take into a factor answering emails for them. And it doesn't take into factor of what the communities have actually spent on their own time. But also the big question is the implementation. For our community plans and our delivery strategy, what the communities want will have to be resourced. This means physical resources from the council. It might mean helping them with grant applications, but it will also be grant applications to other funders to bring forward what they want. And that's in a physical and non-physical nature. But there is still a lot missing for our communities. And again, this is just my perspective and being involved in it for three years. It's all about support, but there's a need for guidance, training and resources for our communities. They just don't have them. For some of our communities, and Kevin will come on this again, we're asking them to start from scratch on things that they don't know about, on plans that they have never done before. Um, and I'm asking them to deliver this in line with council partners and all of that which they just haven't done before but also with the scottish government and planning aid for scotland's guidance this might not go far enough there is an inherent danger in this it's all well seeing guidance and what it is and what it's about and what it can do for you but there needs to be an actual toolkit and how to do these for our communities we need to have a resource for them that they can go through every step and help them when we may be actually busy delivering on other options that's just my presentation, just my views, and uh, hopefully that explains our approach in a bit better detail. Um, these are the contacts for me if anybody else wants to get in touch, um, and if we've got our Twitter feed. But we feel what we're doing in Western Bartonshire is really beneficial, and you'll hear from Kevin next on how they have found the approach. But I must stress, we are still early on in the process and may not be as far along as others that have been doing this for a while. As I've said, East Ayrshire have been doing it for the best part of 10 years. Fife Council have been doing it, and there'll be a lot of you as well. North Ayrshire as well have been doing it with their locality plans. I hope that's been informative. Trevor, if you want to hand over to Kevin. 
Thanks, Anthony. I'm just going to pass over to Kevin just now. Just bear with us a second or two. Okay. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Kevin Mason. I'm the project uh, development manager for uh, a charity called the Limi Foundation based in, in Alexandria. And um, I just want to spend, I think it's uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, giving you an overview uh, on behalf of the Alexandria Neighbourhood Action Group. Um, a little bit of our insights and experiences and, and some of the approaches and, and even at this early stage recommendations maybe from uh, our observations, um, from our involvement in uh, this, what we've called it the neighbourhood um, action plan and the creation of that. So just moving on to the next slide, I, I want to give you just a little bit of background, but probably the first thing is to give you a, a stake in the ground of where we are and what's happening right now. But I also want to maybe just briefly put Alexandria in context in terms of its the historical kind of community governance um kind of almost perceptions feelings on the ground if you will um moving on then to some process observations about the the actual process we've now involved with um or in with our uh, council colleagues and then obviously just finally then some some recommendations um on approaches so in terms of our, our current status i'm I've reminded myself earlier on i think we've been involved in this now formally just over a year and um we we had lots of uh, documents if you will we weren't short of it we had a couple of place standard model um surveys that had been done we had um access to various community feedback surveys that had been done by uh the councils your community group over years and also um kind of practical experience and from individual group surveys that have been conducted by charities or community groups actually located in alexandria so we weren't short of, 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 of that type of foundational information and requirements. Um, it would be fair to say then that at the moment, you know, the group itself consists of a couple of charities, including ourselves, a couple of representatives from local tenants and residents associations, uh, a, a, a kind of, a, I would call it a social enterprise business, and then a community interest company um are involved in in regular meetings um and at times except for the covid pandemic we were actually meeting every couple of weeks particularly to get us through the uh the different um uh, play standard out, um, outputs if you will so that we could get ourselves to a position where we could start to create a, a draft plan so in terms of our current status we've we've got a draft uh, plan at the moment it's probably about 40 percent of the way there um, based on the place standard feedback, uh, we, we've identified a number of themes that we're basing our, our plans, the priorities on. These will be economic, green recovery or infrastructure, uh, green recovery, natural heritage, infrastructure, uh, well-being, health, and, and finally cultural themes. And, and as you probably know yourselves, these are linked together. So um, that that's the process we're in at the moment is to ensure how can we as actively uh, uh, and, and in, in a concise fashion um, highlights the community's priorities with our, our stakeholders, our fellow neighbours, if you will, residents, and, and obviously our, our council colleagues. One of the other things that's worth mentioning at the moment, because it's, it's incredibly exciting, actually, if you work in the community in Alexandria, you work in community development, you'll never have a better opportunity, actually, to get involved in some really interesting work. Um, but with that, the, the kind of converse of that is it's incredibly busy, which is great. But you have the, resili the recovery town centre um, activities that is just kicking off just now. And part of our challenge for us has been to ensure that along with um, the short term priorities that we've identified within our neighbor draft neighbourhood plan, even at this stage, that we are making every effort to work with our uh, council colleagues to link those short-term priorities to the town centre recovery plan. Um, the, so, in terms of we're putting ourselves on the hook, but we've 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 set a date. So I think the next. So one of the gov parts of the governance we have is the in Alexandria is the Alexandria Town Centre Forum, and um, it's meeting next after a break because of the pandemic on August 11th. And it's at that meeting we intend to provide um, visibility to an initial draft of the town centre 
uh, our, our, I beg your pardon, our, our, our neighbourhood plan, but also highlighting those four or five priorities that we've linked to the town centre recovery plan from a short term focus. So in terms of the a little, just very briefly, uh, some context and uh, about Alexandria. Um, it would be fair to say, just in terms of local governance and involvement, just some very black and white statements, and and it's not to go into the detail of this, or, but it, facts, facts. Uh, there, there hasn't been any community council, um, for several years within Alexandria. The Traders Association or Retailers Association has been inactive for for five years, and. There's, you know, you're speaking to people on the ground, and again, I'm not getting into the detail of, you know, the the validity of these things. But look, people feel that the the, the town has has um, hasn't had a lot done to it positively over the last number of years, and other people, other towns have been getting um, resources. That's fine. That's that's just the perception. Not getting into the the the, the kind of the veracity of that. That's just the perception. So we move forward from that. Um, in terms of a little bit of detail, um, I, I, and it's something that's actually, there's a lot of groups in Alexandria, an incredible amount of activity that goes on, but we, we've we struggled sometimes to get a complete picture, if you will, of who the groups are and um, what they're doing and, 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 and to help us in terms of our engagement with people. Um, so, But I'll come more to the actual setup of the community aspect of, of this process uh, later on. Um, some process observations from my colleagues uh, and the other groups on, on the uh, ANA group, as we call it. So again, if you will, these are comments. The first three comments, I'm not going to go into detail on these. They, they are what they are. People are saying that, for example, they have concerns that the work will amount to very little. That's fine. You just accept that and then you try and understand the reasons for it and, 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 and do something about that. Some comments from some of our ANA uh, colleagues around the, the local authority functions, recognising what ANA does, um, and the next comment about trying to get the work of the group to be valued and incorporated. Again, these are observations, perceptions of, of relationships on the ground, which again, put it in the proper context, this is a pilot process, and that, that type of thing is going to have um, uh, its challenges, if you will, and, and lack of clarity, particularly at the beginning. The, the couple of pieces I wanted to just to, to focus on here in bold that one of the biggest observations for, from our perspective, because of the lack of community governance and structures, if you will, uh, and that kind of formal uh, structure involvement at the community level, um, we and with, with the groups, the groups that are sitting around the table have never have never worked together before, or most of them haven't worked together before. And human nature, been what it is, um, you. One of our biggest struggles is maintaining a consistency between community and group goals, right? And that is very much a relationship uh, requirement, if you will. But it's it's something that we it would be fair to say continue to see as a challenge. But there is a, a simple solution to that, both reactively right now, um, and uh, I would say you know, as a corrective action, if you will, going forward in this process, and we'll come to that in the in the recommendation slide next. The difficulty when you have um, partners of differing uh, knowledge, uh, experiences, if you will, you know, going from somebody who's been volunteering from 10 years as a chair of a tenants and residents association as a, as a, as a, as a kind of a voluntary activity, compared to maybe an organization that has brought in lots of funding, has lots of awareness of who to go to, how to get things done in the community, that can uh, and does lead to the, the risk of a two-speed approach. And I think, again, let me, rather than getting into the detail of that, we'll, we discuss that from a point of view of what recommendations would we, we make. And, and simply, if, if any, it doesn't matter if it's the ANA group, whether it's your favourite sporting team, what have you, if people aren't going out on the pitch as a group with a consistent vision and aim of what they're about and what they're trying to achieve, you will get this difference in approaches, the difference in in um, relationships and so on. Um, it's not rocket science, it's just life. And again, it's more important what you do about this. What, how can we minimise the risk of, of those relationship type uh, impacts on the quality of our output on behalf of our community? The other thing, as I mentioned earlier on very quickly, was 
uh, it's an exciting time to be on the ground working in, in, in communities in Alexandria, it really is. Um, there is a lot going on. So, for example, we've got social housing programmes, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we have uh, heritage, um, smaller phones, and for example, historical um, items potentially been upgraded and what have you. Um, we have significant potential uh, developments in other parts of Alexandria. And then you've got all our own work, if you will, that we're trying to link. So there's a fantastic amount of exciting opportunities and work that's happening. They need to be linked. They need to be linked so there is a common theme, uh, there's a common approach, so that one part of, if, if we're looking at in, uh, changing or improving infrastructure, it's really important that the theme and the consistency is reflected through our entire community footprint, not just one part of the town, for example. Um, never mind to say anything about resources and duplication and, and the need to minimise that risk. Um, just a, a quick point around the um, COVID. Yeah, there, there is so much happening at the moment. I mean, we're very fortunate um, to have a strategy like the Community Empowerment Strategy that is working with people on the ground and is looking to put practical frameworks for people on the ground, you know, by street, by post, but to make a difference to not only where they live, but their own, the quality of their own lives as a result. So I think that from a general observation on the our neighbourhood planning process, when there are other uh, discussions from a community empowerment point of view ongoing, for example, it might be in the community wealth area, um, uh, just to, to take one example, it's it's very important if if there's a if there is a pilot activity or there's a number of um, neighbourhood plan local plan type activities that the connectivity even at the earliest point with um, these community empowerment themes and the development of those policies and frameworks are connected with these other pilot activities that were in were in the within the community. Um, so just the, the next slide. Um, just in the final, this is the final uh, slide. So um, a quote from one of our, our ANA colleagues, uh, and it's important to, you know, when we looked back at this and we reflected on, on where we are, um, and we absolutely believe that we're going to come out with the help of everybody involved, our stakeholders, council colleagues, we're, we're going to come out with a, with a, a quality um, uh, output, if you will, and a quality plan with, with, with ideas that will really, and requirements that will really engage people. Now, at the end of the day, that's easy for us to say. Our community will will decide that 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 fact for us. But it, it's what is absolutely clear in terms of if we were to start this process again in terms of the the creation of the community team, uh, looking at creating a community plan. A lot of our initial work would have been helped tremendously by having uh, a, a strong independent facilitator uh, present, um, somebody who has, if you will, the experience to, to recognise these different dynamics in groups, the different dynamics that come about because of the different uh, capacities that you find in communities. Um, and it, it, it shouldn't be up to the community, particularly communities where there hasn't been history, recent history of a lot of uh, capacity to do these things for themselves. They really in our view, in our observations, if we were doing this again, we would certainly recommend that a community like ourselves would need help with a strong independent facilitator. And and some of the tools that that independent facilitator could help us with, uh, I think uh, um, was alluded, Anthony alluded earlier on, in terms of a concise resource toolkit. So, and, and I'll give you an idea later on, of what do we mean by that? Well, making sure that everybody around the table has the same knowledge of what funding sources are available. Right, and what their criteria are. Uh, that, that's a, a fundamental basic. Having an understand uh, uh, the community and the community group having an understanding of who are all the stakeholders involved in this of partners and what support do they bring to the table. And finally, you know, in terms of the process structure, what, what is process escalation resolution? Because you know, the, the great thing about this, and we need, I think Anthony mentioned a little bit of conflict. Well, you need sometimes you need to have those kind of passionate discussions um, because what we're doing is very important um, for ourselves and for families and, and, and for, for children in particular. So it, it requires our best, it requires our passionate and, and focused approach. But again, there needs to be the definition of in those situations, it's not just, I would suggest, 
officers and, and, and other stakeholders how to deal with that. It's how the communities deal with that and individuals, particularly within something like the locality plan uh, team and so on. So if I was to, to, to summarize in terms of what would be the one thing from our collective feedback at the moment around this process and this, the setup of the community, the, the, the action uh, to look at uh, creating a locality plan or a neighborhood action plan. Coalescing people around a common vision is absolutely critical. In, in reflection, what we did, and, and for understandable reasons, we got, we got carried away with ourselves and excited about the, the, the getting the actual neighborhood plan started. And we set ourselves internal dates uh, to get a neighborhood plan done by the 31st or the 30th of March, 2020, right? Um, in hindsight, what we probably would have been very helpful is for us, again, with that kind of facilitation support and to, to create that common vision from the very outset and, and to highlight a set of consistent values and principles, if you will, for the operation of an organ, a, a group like ANA. So that that would have been a very useful approach to actually build relationships, build knowledge of each other within the ANA group and our wider community. And, and to almost ferment a little bit of may, maybe more, more trust at the beginning, all right? Um, so I think that from us is a, is a key thing. And, and having that trust, the, the reason why it is absolutely fundamental, um, when you look at the number of individual groups, if I talk about what each group and what some of the groups are looking for, if you, if you add up the potential cost of investment around their individual projects, that, that's about seven or eight million. And, and our instincts, if you will, as, as, as residents, as neighbours is, unless we get ourselves together, uh, collaborate, connect the outcomes, reduce duplication, we, we, we run the risk of reducing the attractiveness of Alexandria for that transformative investment. And if we, don't, and if we do that, we're, we're not only letting ourselves down, but we're letting the rest of our community down. So this is a very, very important aspect, particularly in the world that we're about to enter where resources are going to be reduced even further. The need to be absolutely crystal clear on why we're sitting around the, the, the table. What is it that we want to achieve for our community? And how do we share and access resources to make that a reality? That's absolutely uh, necessary from the very off. Um, so uh, that's the end of my uh, just brief um, um, presentation. I'm far, my apologies, I, I did not put uh, further contact details as Anthony has done on the end of my slide, or presentation. So if anybody needs, wants to follow up on this, um, I mean, Trevor, is there something I could just, you can share my email address, it's, it's fine. Yeah, um, uh, we normally, at the end of uh, each of our webinars, we will be uh, sending out an email with uh, a link to the recording we've just taken mm -hmm. um, and other materials. Um, I'll be sending the slides out then uh, mm -hmm. as soon as we finish the meeting.